Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for taking the time this afternoon to be with us today. Uh, I'll be sharing with you the project that I managed, I just recently managed. So we just ended this project last March 31. Um, and so many of the things that are that I'm going to be presenting here, I presented also last, last March one to a broader audience. Uh, but I added a few things here also to provide more context. Um, and the presentation will have the following um, flow. So I'm going to first present who Rare Philippines is, uh, well, Rare in general. Um, and then I'm going to be presenting also the uh, components of the project. I'm going to be presenting to you what we have done, what we have learned, and what are the other things that we thought you know, we should be doing. Uh, in the, at the end of the presentation, as Siskin said, we're going to have an open forum so you can ask questions because there are a lot more nuances and details um, in, the, in the project that you might be interested to pursue. So let me... Sorry, I'm visually impaired, so bear with me. I'm, I'm actually legally blind, so I'm trying to adjust. All right. So uh, for, for Rare, uh, we know that in, in many of our environmental problems, people are always the culprit. But we also believe that they're also part of the solution for the issues that we are facing in the environment. Um, and so, I, sorry. Um, and all of this is, we're looking at behavior change as key. Because many of the issues and concerns that we are facing is based on behaviors that we have adapted or we have retained over the years. And so we've seen that you know, many of the environmental problems that we have, uh, we see that behavior change is um, a key to, to solving some of those issues. So Rare is a US NGO, we're based in Arlington, Virginia, that's our headquarters. But we have different offices in different countries that includes the Philippines. Um, and we have more than 150, uh, possibly more now, um, employees in total. Um, and so for Rare, we use a lot of social marketing and behavior change um, techniques. And one of the flagship programs that we have is called the Pride Campaign. The Pride Campaign is essentially uh, mentoring and training individuals who are based in their institutions with key social marketing approaches so that we'll be able to help change the behaviors of the communities and of the people that we are working with. Um, and we have done more than, I guess by now it's about more than 400 pride campaigns in different parts of the world. The most famous of which is in St. Lucia in, the South, in South America where we started our pride campaign where our one of our early um, founders have actually saved one of the species of parrot in St. Lucia. He's now actually considered a hero in St. Lucia. Um, and so that's where we started the Pride campaign in order for us and in a way develop a turnkey solution that we can uh, bring to different parts of the world. In the Philippines, um, depending on high tide or low tide, uh, we have 7,107 islands. Uh, 891 of which are coastal municipalities. So just imagine the vast, um, the big area where coastal communities are located and the impact of fisheries in the lives of the people in that area. Um, we work with what we call um, conservation fellows. So the conservation fellows, these are, most of them are employees of the local government units. We train them on social marketing. We train them on the Pride campaign so that they become advocates and they become champions in the area to push conservation efforts. Uh, and we have more than, I think we have more than 100 uh, conservation fellows now in different parts of the, of the country. Uh, in the Philippines, we've done three cohorts of uh, Pride campaigns and um, conservation campaigns in the country. Um, that's what we, you know, we have here three different color sites, but all in all, in the Philippines, we have more than close to 100 towns in the country that we have impacted in various degrees of engagement. 
Some of them are really intense, just like what, what we're going to be presenting you later. Some of them are really arms led kind of engagement. You train them, they implement um, the program. And currently, we're engaging with different um, the government agencies like the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, uh, the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. We're training their, their team and their people also on how to manage social marketing campaigns so that they can incorporate behavior change in their efforts to help conserve um, the ecosystems that they're interested in. Um, let me share to you very briefly some of the status in the state of Philippine fisheries. Um, I guess many of us are more familiar with agriculture ecosystem or agriculture system. So for, for some of you, this may be the first time, but for others, maybe this is the, you know, this is a review. Um, the Philippines, if you look at it, 1.6 million Filipinos you know, are dependent on artisanal fishing. Uh, but if you look at the, the statistics also below, uh, a great majority of our fishers are municipal fishers. Um, and, but the production of fish comes for mostly from aquaculture. But the employment opportunity is very limited in aquaculture. If you look at the, the statistics, it's only 1% compared to municipal or artisanal fishing, which is a significant portion, and yet very little is being done in terms of addressing the employment gap. Um, there are also 6 million Filipinos dependent on oceans for food and livelihood. Uh, so they are not only fishers, but they are also downstream and upstream industries that are dependent with our, uh, in our oceans. Now. Um, but sadly, fishers are the poorest in terms of economic strata in the country. So if you look at all the statistics, actually it has already improved recently, and the has credited this for their efforts in terms of resolving some of the poverty issues. Um, so it, it is now, they said it's about 31% compared to the national average of 21%, still a big gap in terms of poverty incidence, difference in poverty incidence. Um, and yet, more than 50% of our protein requirements comes from fish. Meron ba dito hindi ng fish? Wala? Uh, sa, sa, sa Los Banos, pag sinabi nga na, di ba, di ano, nakain ka ba ng isla? Uh, if, if you're being asked, you know, if you're eating fish. No? But, you know, the reality right now is that the, the catch effort, uh, what we call this the catch per unit effort, every time the, the fishers go out and fish, it is declining. You'll be happy to get right now, based on the statistics that we have, every fisher that we work with, they're going to be happy to go home with about 3 kilos each of catch every day. <laughs> People th thought that when we when we when we go we have we still have a lot of fish because when we go to the market there's still a lot of fish. What I learned most most recently is that many of these fish are actually imported. We're importing a lot of fish from Indonesia right now because their fisheries is still intact. So we're importing a lot of fish, but coast uh, but fish coming from Philippine waters is really on the decline. But the Philippines is also um, given the decline. The Philippines is also one of the center of biodiversity in the world. In fact, um, Berry Island Passage, which is very close here, uh, between Batangas and Occidental Mindoro, is considered the center of center of biodiversity in the world. No? And be, yet very few people know that. Um, I was also talking to another person that we were in San Francisco three weeks ago, <laughs> and he went to the California Academy of Sciences. They've actually imported coral reefs from Anilao fishes from Anilao and set it up in the California Academy of Sciences. So if you happen to go and visit San Francisco, go to that, uh, to that place, you're going to see Philippine Reef and it's all Anilao, although they put bamboos inside, which we were all laughing when we saw bamboos there, because there's no bamboos in, uh, mostly in marine um, ecosystem. Um, so Rare has, together with other partners, including the Environmental De Defense Fund and um, other organizations have formulated the program we call Fish Forever. And Fish Forever has different components, so it encompasses a number of different um, areas of fisheries management. Um, the situation in the Philippines is an open access system. If you're familiar with an office, if you're not familiar with an open access system, that means every person who has an intent to fish can fish. Uh, there's no there's no license, there's no permits that you need to go. That's why in one of our sites in Chargao, very shopping, they, in one of our surveys, we have identified 
more than 200 types of poison being used in order for them to catch fish, from dishwashing paste to shampoo. Um, and so it's an open access system, and that's why we're also experiencing a lot of damage in our ecosystem. So we've, we've come up with a, with a solution called Fish Forever, um, focusing on the managed access area, meaning only people who are registered fishers and licensed fishers are allowed to fish in certain areas, and we provide for no take zone. So let me just show you some of the uh, things that we have developed. Um, so first, we're looking at um, areas of policy. Uh, we're helping our local government units come up with policies to rationalize the use of their system or of their ecosystem uh, so that we can avoid the, the uh, issue of uh, open access. Uh, we look at governance, so we're, we're helping um, marine municipal fisheries and aquatic resource management committees or MFARMCs um, together with the local government units come up with um, better governance system for, for the ecosystem. I was talking earlier uh, about the conflict in terms of resource management. Everything above the reef is in the mandate, within the mandate of the v, uh, Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, but the reef system is under DNR. So can you imagine if you dive into the water and you encounter the reef, then DNR can charge you for that. But if you go up, then be far is going to be the person managing that resource. So there's already um, some issues that needs to be solved in terms of management of the resource itself. Yeah. Uh, we're also helping them in terms of enforcement. We have a lot of bandai dagas, no? so uh, we get we help deputize some of the uh, fishers to become law enforcers in their areas. Um, we've also looked at a number of you know fisheries management um, systems. Uh, we, we help in terms of licensing, registration. Of course, it's BFAR's mandate to do registration and licensing as well as the LGU. We also help them in terms of catch monitoring. Um, in the Philippines, there's no catch monitoring, meaning if you catch something, you should be reporting that. Uh, if you watch Discovery Channel or National Geographic, you know, when they get yeah, wicked tuna, if you look at wicked tuna, they have a registration, so they register you know, what tuna they caught and you know, what is the weight of the tuna and how long it is. In the Philippines, they should also be doing that, but no one is doing that, or very few people are doing that. Um, we've also looked at mapping of the area to make sure that um, we identify the areas where it should be, there should be a reserved area or a managed access area. Um, so when we say managed access area, what, that, what it means is that we've created a zone on the water to identify which areas are no take zones, meaning you know, no fishing activity should happen in that area because those are critical habitats for fish and marine resources. But there's also managed access area where different um, fishers, fishers can actually fish, but using also regulated uh, fishing gears. For example, we have areas where hook and line can you know, only hook and line can be used. Um, where there are areas where we allow um, nets to be used, so um, we, we will be able to regulate the cash. One of the hardest part of this job is actually convincing the fishers to reduce their catch. You know? Because there's no way for us to achieve sustainable fisheries if we don't reduce the catch. Um, how, how do we do that? You know? So there are a number of different things that, that we do. One of which is really focusing on community support. We do a lot of social marketing campaigns. I'm, I'm not sure if you have courses or you've done social marketing, uh, you've uh, attended social marketing courses, but we do a lot of social marketing activities. We work with the communities, um, we we created social marketing um, materials. We have calendars, this one is a calendar, so every time you click the, the calendar, you can see you know, what you should be doing in order for you to uh, conserve your environment. We we have a lot of meetings, we, we work with communities, we educate them, they also educate us, they help us understand you know, how to manage the resource better. Um, we, you know, the calendar that I've shown you before, uh, one of the municipalities that we're working with even come up with sasaktong uh, panagat sikat, meaning in Tagalog, pagtama ang pangingisla mo, ikaw ang sikat. No? So they call them the star fishers. No? So meron sila nga, they, they have this kind of system in order for them to um, reward positive behaviors. Um, so we also have low campaign logo. This one is a grouper, no? Uh, by the way, we have size na hindi pa nila nakakakita ng malaking 
Lapu-Lapu. They've never seen a big Lapu-Lapu. They thought that Lapu-Lapu cannot grow bigger than two kilos. No? So, because everyone is catching them in a juvenile. Um, we use a lot of mascots. Uh, you mascots are the same maker of Jollibee mascots. So for every site, we have a mascot, and the mascot represents the conservation efforts and the conservation initiatives being done in the site. We support a lot of you know, street activities, we have beer, billboards, um, as I said, we use a lot of mascots. A mascot, but na photo, every time we, we go to the site and we have a program, we always have a mascot. It conveys the idea of conservation uh, to all people. We use boat awnings whenever you, you know, we have boats, we have uh, messages, we have billboards. You know? um, and out of these initiatives, we've been able to see an increase in terms of biomass in the area. Many of the sites that we have have actually increased yung catch ng fishers done. The recent, I don't know if you heard about this, but the Department of Agriculture has a, has a program called MLK, or Malinis at Ma Sagan Karagatan, not yung Malalang Kaya. Uh, and they gave Riwa, um, a prize of, I think, 20 million pesos last year, and the winner was one of our sites. Um, but ito, picture ito na, na, na photo ito sa Pilar sa Amotes Island. This is, was two days after Yolanda. These are Bantay Dagats. Um, so after they took care of their houses, they went and, and rebuilt the uh, watch station uh, because they know that they need to uh, safeguard yung marine resources nila. Sabi nila, sira na nga yung bahay namin, masisira pa, nanakawin pa yung isla namin. So we need to make sure that we take care of our resources. And this is part of the social marketing campaign and behavior change that we have done. Now one of the components of Fish Forever is called Markets and Enterprises, which I am really uh, and I'm going to as I said to you, I'm going to share with you a project that was funded by USAID and Bloomberg Philanthropies. This is a 30-month project, a uh, $2.3 million project, implemented in seven sites. Um, seven, when I say sites, it's seven towns in the county that includes two in Lubang Island um, in Occidental Mindoro, two in Negros Oriental, Bindoy Ayuman, the towns of Bindoy Ayuman, two in Surigao del Sur, Cortes and Campina, and one in Pinambak in Cabarino Sur. Uh, so, the, 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 the issue in the Philippines is really overfishing. Our fish are really overfished. So, one of the things that uh, we said that we want to accomplish with Fish Forever is put up uh, stuff in terms of the open access system. Uh, but at the same time also, what we wanted to find out is that the hypothesis that we have for the project is that is there a market incentive out there that will help us increase the support um, and hasten or catalyze the behavior change among fishers to su support more sustainable fishing practices. And so we proposed to, um, to USA and Bloomberg an economic development program that focuses on economic, building economic resilience and economic development. Um, we're hoping that with this two-prong uh, approach, we'll be able to contribute towards reducing um, overfishing and contribute to sustainable fisheries. Um, we, we use a lot of approaches, and one of the things that we have used in, in our approach is a rapid prototyping. We, we've done a lot of rapid prototypes. We do a lot of research, but immediately develop products and services or ideas and put it in the hands of the user so that we can see and evaluate and get feedback whether those ideas are going to work. Um, and we've also done a lot of foundational studies. Um, we've conducted livelihood, coastal livelihood review. We've covered about 10 years worth of coastal livelihood programs in the Philippines in about at least five regions in the country. We've also done a number of different studies, including stock assessment. Stock assessment is very important because we, what we want to understand is that any economic interventions or any interventions in the ecosystem should not increase, should not redound to increase in fishing pressure. Because what usually happens in economic development programs is that you're incentivizing people from earning more money, and therefore the response of the people is that we need to catch more so that we can earn more money. So what we want to understand is, um, is there enough fish out there? And if the fish that we're trying to connect to, to the market, um, will, will it increase its what? Will, it, will we be able to reduce its vulnerability or increase uh, fishing pressure? We've also done value chain studies. I think we've conducted, I can't, I can't remember the how many, but we probably covered around 40 or 50 species in the seven sites, eight sites that we, we did uh, value chain studies and stock assessment. Um, so what have we learned from these studies? Um, 
for the foundational uh, for, for the library studies, this is very obvious for, for many of many of you, I guess. You know, many of them are really supply driven. Many of them are focused, not focused in terms of building equity in the market. Uh, I mean equity among the beneficiaries uh, of, the, of the program. And what we've also seen is that there are a lot of vulnerable species um, based on the staff assessment. So we decided not to connect those species to the market so that we can put more conservation efforts in those species. Um, and for, for value chain studies, we've also learned um, a number of different things, including there's very little value addition being done on the fish. Many of them are just selling the fish directly to the market, fresh. Uh, but we didn't start really with an economic program. What we what we learned from different studies and also from you know from from my own experience, I'm a fan of a you know fisherman. Uh, I live my life for since until college. We I work as a you know I work in fishing. In a fishing ground in Laguna de Bay, um, on weekends I go out and fish. Yeah. So I understand and I live the life of a uh, fishing family. And one of the things that you know, I've learned and we've learned also from different experiences is we need to be a household resilience. Because the problem with most households, especially poor households, is that they're poor because they don't have assets. So what we try to do is actually build the asset of the household so that they'll be able to participate more productively in different initiatives. Um, because based on the studies that we have, uh, you know, we have reviewed, many of them have really little value to the, to the program. What usually happens in economic development programs is that, especially donor-funded programs, the, the first the first thing that they're going to do is that I'm going to give you money. Here's some here's money. You start a business, and that's the start of failure of many of the programs because they don't really buy into the program. So what we decided to do is use a third key solution called Village Savings and Loans Association. This has been a technology proven in different parts of the world, uh, more, more notably in Africa. Uh, we tested this in the Philippines way back in early, late 90s and early 2000s, but it failed because of a number of different um, issues. But the Village Savings and Loans Association, or VS, VSLA method, have solved many of those issues, including safety and security of the money. As a result, we've been able to mobilize 14.5 million pesos um, over 22 months. And this is, for, for I guess for many of the people that we've talked to, especially in mainstream, this is a small amount. But imagine 14.5 million pesos in the hands of more than 2,000 poor households. This is a lot of money. Uh, and what we've been able to do with the, with the savings club, reform savings club, Collins savings club, they will be able to use the money to support their family and reduce their overall vulnerability. If someone gets sick, part of the fund of the uh, a part of the money that they save is actually being given as grant in order for them to get more social protection. Uh, and many of our sites have actually leveled up or upgraded the system. Uh, many of them have enrolled in SSS. Uh, they already paid for premium in SSS, so they get more protection. Pensionado sila Many of the fishers have actually appealed and involved in SSS, so to increase their, their, um, their social protection. Many of them have actually opened up new businesses. Uh, many of them have supported their existing businesses. And one of the more poignant uh, things that we've learned from, from, the, from the group is that they've been able to keep their kids in school. And investing in human capital, as we know, is one of the um, strongest assets the household can build because they'll be able to get out of poverty faster compared to just building physical assets. Um, one of the nice stories that we've heard from, from the groups that we've worked with, was actually in the of Sur, there was an old woman who joined the savings club, and we asked her why, why she joined the savings club. She said, I'm very old now, but my kids are giving me some money, so what, um, what, what small money my kids give me, I, I set aside a portion of that in our savings club. Uh, so that I can bring my, my grandchildren to Jollibee this Christmas. Uh, so this is you know, the very, very simple aspiration, but very strong impact to the household and to the saver themselves. Um, but still, you know, even, even the 2,000 members that we have and more than 100 savings clubs formed in 16 towns in the country, there's still a lot to be done. And we would like to use the savings club um, for more collective action. We'd like to see how we can mobilize them to consolidate small catch. 
Because the problem of small scale fishers is that they're catching very small volume of catch. So if, if you have small volume of catch, you don't have leverage in the market. And that's why sometimes you always think that the traders are the evil ones because they're the ones making money out of the poor. But it's exactly the issue of fragmentation of the market and fragmentation of suppliers. You know, you have very small catch and therefore you don't have a leverage in the market and therefore you cannot demand for higher price. So we'd like to see you know, the, the savings that in different towns, for example, in some of, the, some of our sites, uh, the savings that are the single dominant association in, in the area. So imagine the possibility of consolidating and organizing small fishers and consolidating their small catch so that they can create more leverage in the market. Uh, we see, so we, we'd like to see in the, in the future, and this is what we'd like to work with, doing more collective action. And, and now that they have money, then we introduce to them a, um, an income generating activity, uh, and we, 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 this is more focused on conservation. I think the difference about the approach that we've done is this is more focused on conservation rather than just making money alone. The, we're, we're, asked, we're, we're helping them make money so that they, we can increase their uh, support and catalyze the transformation of their behaviors to support more sustainable fishing practices. Um, how did we do that? No? So what, as, as I mentioned in the studies that we have conducted, these are the major issues that we face. And now that the groups have actually had savings, what we did is that we formed conservation enterprise group. Uh, so these are the business groups in our side. The money that they used for capital in the business actually came from the savings that they uh, invested in the savings plan. Um, and so what, what we did is form six conservation enterprises. Uh, right now, you can see on the left side or right, right hand side, um, the draft fish drying uh, business that uh, our groups have started. This dried fish is now being sold in premium markets in key cities in the country. And it's also, if you are in New York and if you are in Kansas City, you'll be able to see some of this fish being cooked in some of the food trucks and some of the boutique uh, Filipino hotels and restaurants in those places. Um, the, the, the good thing about this is that we've been able to partner with mission aligned organizations now. So I'm going to be, going to be talking to you later about um, that, that partnership. What, what we've done is that uh, we didn't give them capital to start their business. So they used their own savings to capitalize their business. Uh, but we gave, them, we gave them business assets. Business assets are really critical in order for them to make sure that they have the highest quality uh, products out there. We help them in terms of increasing the quality of their product. Uh, how many of you are eating or would like, you know, are eating dried fish or love dried fish? How many you, of you like dangil? Which one, the small one or the big one? Of course, you like the small one because it's crunchy, right? But you're eating juvenile fish. So it's just like eating your baby for breakfast. Now, the truth is that we're, we're advocating now that the certain size of the fish that you need to be um, eating. So the small dangit, please don't buy them. Now, that's part of my advocacy. So the next time you go to the grocery, please don't buy the small dangit because those are juvenile fish. Uh, the the dangit that we're selling, you know, if you're buying, going to buy from us, are, are mature mature fish. Uh, this is, this fish is flying fish. How many of you have actually eaten flying fish? Maybe. Maybe or have seen flying fish? Yeah. So no one can imagine, you know, eating flying fish. And this is the beauty of the program that we have done. We've chosen species that are actually not vulnerable, not not already not vulnerable in their state. So what we what we've been able to do is use some of the unconventional species, process them, develop some products out of them, and then offer them to the market. Um, because we've been able to convince, sorry, we've been able to convince. Sorry. So what we've been able to do is that use some of the um, um, unconventional species. So we have flying fish.
Boleh lebih 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 Yeah. Yeah. So part of part of the program, as I mentioned to you, is that we're using the economic, the market's incentive as a way for us to strengthen support to sustainable fisheries. Part of the promise that we give to the consumers or to the buyers of our products is that there are more behaviors that we're incentivizing um, uh, under this program. Uh, we're not buying fish if the fisher is not licensed or registered. We're not buying fish if the fisher is not reporting their catch. We're not buying their fish if they're not participating in meetings. And we're not buying fish um, if, they're used, uh, if they catch them using illegal gears. Uh, so we're hoping that with these four behaviors, we'll be able to incentivize fishers to practice more sustainable fishing practices. Um, and as a result of this um, engagement with the fishers, we've been able to increase the price of their product between 100 to 200 percent. In some other places, we've been able to increase it three times, the, the local market price. Um, and we've been able to increase the value of the investment of the fishers and of the households in the conservation enterprises by as much as 50 percent. Most of them initially gave out 500 pesos as initial investment in the conservation enterprise. After nine months or uh, 10 months, the value of their share has increased to now 900 pesos per share. Because we've been buying their, their, their product at a premium. Uh, if you go to EcoStore, how many of you have been to EcoStore? Rustan, Simbolica, about real food in Molito. Medyo high on the stores namin. We've been selling tangit for 1,200 pesos a kilo. We've been selling posit squid at 1,000 pesos. We've been selling uh, flying fish for 1,000 pesos. All because we're, we're helping local municipal fish, fishers uh, practice sustainable fishing. Um, so every time that the fishers sell their product or their catch to our group, they get, they're being paid on average 50% more than what they can get from other traders or other buyers in the area. Ah, uh, sorry, it's just a type of error. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because you might have developed a different model that's the name. Right, yeah, sorry, it's just a type of error. Thank you. Um, work with um, private sector partners because it enabled us to reduce the learning curve of our fishers. Because many of the programs being implemented in fishes, and not just in fishes but also in agriculture, is very supply-led. What we've done is actually do a more market-oriented program because um, we don't have the capacity and the time and the energy to do market development. Doing market development is really quite expensive and takes a long time. So by partnering with mission-aligned organizations, we've been able to bring our products directly to the consumers or faster to the consumers, and we've been able to see um, the rewards um, from, from the market. So we, they get immediate incentive, and they see that you know, doing the right thing actually pays off. Um, so by, by partnering with social enterprises, we're partnering with some private corporations, some of one of the private corporations that we're working with are exporting tuna and some high-value species in the U.S. and Europe. And they're also supplying the five-star hotels and uh, hotels and restaurants in Manila. Um, so we've been able to partner with them and we've been able to really shorten the learning curve of our fishes and they've been able to bring their products to the market faster. Um, Uh, what else needs to be done? There's still a need for us to look at 
um, how we can diversify, how can we open more more sites? Because the problem that we have is that there's a huge demand. What, what we experience is that there's a high demand for the products that we are offering to the market. Our problem is that we cannot supply to them because of the really depleted marine resources in the country. Um, so demand is not an issue for us. So what we've been trying to do, and also we're being impacted by changing climatic patterns. Um, you know, some other people don't want to call it as climate change, but we are experiencing a lot of you know change in climatic patterns. For example, it's supposed to be fishing season for certain species, and yet we don't see that fish. Before we started in one of the sites, a uh, kilo of squid is only 40 pesos, and we said, okay, once we start the program, we can we can buy everything and we can sell it to the market. Um, 30 months have passed. We have not even dried a single gram of squid in that area. Because there's no squid, even if there's squid, um, there's very little supply. Right now, the per kilo of squid in the air is 120 pesos. Because fishers cannot catch them or cannot um, get enough of the supply. So we'd like to see more locations, more places where we can do this activity so that we can address the issue of supply. For example, if there's something happens in the eastern seaboard of the country, we can rely on the western seaboard of the country to supply and manage um, the, the demand uh, from the market. Uh, we also need like to see an additional investment in terms of uh, training, in terms of assets for, for the fishers and, and their businesses. Um, we work with some of the chefs. Uh, we work with some of the chefs um, in Manila. They help us develop some of the products. For example, for Madrid Fusion, if you're familiar with Madrid Fusion, it's one of the biggest culinary uh, events, um, not just in the Philippines but in the world. Uh, so they're bringing different chefs from different places, different countries. And they, these two chefs have actually developed products out of uh, menu, out of our products, and we showcased it in Madrid Fusion last year. And we again get an invitation this year to uh, showcase uh, more products uh, in Madrid Fusion. But we need more market and product development activities. Um, that's why we're, I'm trying to work with the food science here in order for us in order for them to provide support to us in terms of developing new products. But we also need to look at market development. That's why one of these days you're going to be seeing passing the kiosk here. You know? We're going to be putting some of our products here so that you, know, you can also get to experience the freshest and highest quality products that our, group, that our groups uh, have been developing. But there's also a lot of consumer education. So the one that I mentioned to you that you know, we shouldn't be buying uh, small rabbit fish. Yung dangit actually is called rabbit fish. Kasi no? uh, mo multiply, that's why it's called rabbit fish. These don't buy the small ones because those are juvenile fish. But there's still a lot of consumer education that needs to happen. For example, when we go to five-star hotels, the, uh, they're still asking from us the usual suspect, groupers, lapu-lapu, snappers, or maya-maya. And those are already vulnerable species. So next time you order in the, in the hotels or restaurants, please be mindful that what you're ordering is something already vulnerable or possibly juvenile. Or you're possibly eating farm fish, and you know what farm fish means. Um, so we, we need a lot of um, education, consumer education, we're doing a lot of um, social marketing efforts in that respect. And then we also have complementary um, activities. We, we help our communities improve their post-harvest um, processing, post-harvest systems. Because based on studies, 25 to 30 percent of the quality of the product of the fish is already lost because of poor post-harvest post handling practices. Um, so what usually happens is that, uh, our hypothesis is that if only you can improve post-harvest practices, if we can only reduce half of the post-harvest losses, that means more money in the pocket of our, of our fishes, even without any additional market intervention. Uh, but, you know, so this is one of the, we've launched a campaign called C3 Campaign. So this is more than C2. So we, we developed C3, or Cool, Clean, and Care. What essentially does is that teaching both the consumers and the fishers and the processors to practice um, proper post-harvest practices or use uh, proper post-harvest practices to make sure that they produce the highest quality fish uh, available in, 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 in the market. The only promise that we give to the consumers of our products is that what they're going to be consuming is the highest quality, properly handled fish um, that they can possibly find in the market. No? 
hindi uh, naman sa pag-ano doon sa ibang mga fish products. That's why muna sila mas mahal yung salmon because many of the fish that you can get, for example, dry fish in the market, kadamihan dito, these are already, tawag nila, surplus or in Tagalog, parang latak na siya. Anything that cannot be disposed or near decomposition, total decomposition, they dry it. Kaya muna yung nagbibili natin mga products. So, yung products that we are developing, we make sure that you know, they're not, they're the freshest um, batch there is now. Um, so there are a number of different things but that, that we've done um, in the market. You know, we're working with uh, partners, so we build their lo the local capacity of our partners so that we can develop uh, local capacity so that they can continue this work. Because the problem with the work that we have is that we're very dollar dependent. So now that the project is over and our funding is also over, um, we, we train a number of um, local partners um, in, in the techniques and the technologies and the systems that we have uh, used in the project. And now they're continuing this work. They're organizing safety lab, they're helping our conservation enterprises. And we're hoping with that kind of process, we'll be able to sustain this initiative. Um, so I guess you know, that's the end of my presentation. I'm sure Marami Pan. We, we can talk a lot more about this, this uh, program, but um, I think we're open for questions. <laughs>